Good morning. Uh, I'm quite happy to be able to meet with all of you today. Uh, I am a, a vitreoretinal surgeon and medical retina expert who has been volunteering with Orbis for the past 28 years. It seems like a short period of time to me, but in looking at the registration list for uh, this presentation today, I see that there are several familiar faces of people I've worked with in the past, so that's uh, heartwarming to say the least. Um, we do have a list of questions we'll try to address either during the talk or at the conclusion of the talk. Uh, if not, I'm sure that you can email additional questions subsequently as well. Uh, our topic for today is the open globe. Uh, what I wanted to uh, discuss with you this morning is our approach to the open globe. And what we'll do first is define the open globe, the subset of uh, traumatized patients that we're speaking about. And then we'll go through therapy and some of the special considerations that one needs to have in mind to manage these patients. Uh, this particular patient is uh, one of our patients seen here in New Hampshire in the Northern United States, who was actually brought into the hospital by helicopter. And although that seems dramatic, I think it illustrates how nervous uh, referral personnel, referral physicians, ambulance drivers, et cetera, are when they see an injured globe. I'm sure you've seen that in your operating rooms. Uh, it may be difficult to get some nurses to work with you doing uh, eye surgery. And part of that is because of a, a innate fear of the delicate nature of the eye. So our learning objectives for today are to recall that we should plan emergent exploration of a suspected globe uh, open opening, review the eye wall closure techniques that are important, recall the 8090-10-0 rule, and think endophthalmitis. We have some questions that I'd like to uh, ask you to answer in your own mind. Uh, we'll have a poll, but we won't give the correct answers until later in the talk, just so we can uh, measure uh, how much you're able to absorb, I would say. Uh, the sclera is thinnest at A, the limbus, B, the equator, C, the rectus insertions, or D, the macula. So we'll review the answer later, but I would say the vast majority of you pick the rectus insertions. Two, uh, siderosis refers to which type of intraocular foreign body? A, copper, B, glass, C, iron, or D, aluminum? And I would say that the majority again chose iron. And the last question, what is the most severe form of traumatic endophthalmitis? Is it A, staph aureus, B, pseudomonas, C, bacillus cereus, or D, A and B. And about half of you picked A and B, Staph aureus and Pseudomonas. I'd like to review the classification of ocular trauma because the terminology that we use to describe eye injury has been uh, rather muddled over the past 30 to 40 years. So we've all agreed on a standard form of nomenclature so that all physicians and surgeons can speak about the same type of injury one to another and also use the same definitions in their research. Uh, this is one ocular trauma book I'd like to recommend because it's quite easy to understand and also touches on the main themes of ocular trauma with multiple little sections of uh, pearls that are helpful in management. When we review an eye trauma case, we can define uh, the trauma by the type of trauma, its grade or level of vision, whether or not an afferent pupillary defect is present, and the extent or zone of the eye that is involved. There are closed globe injuries, which we're not going to address today. Closed globe injuries are essentially bruises or blunt force injuries to the eye that do not uh, open the eye wall. And those may be contusions or partial thickness lamellar lacerations or superficial foreign bodies that do not actually enter the globe. Today, we're going to be talking about an open globe or a full thickness subset of injuries. And these may be due to blunt trauma or rupture of some section of the eye, 
or they may be sharp injuries, uh, like a surgical wound, for example. And these lacerating uh, injuries may be penetrating, and penetrating means one entry into the eye. They may be perforating, which means two or more entries. And this is typically seen where a foreign body enters the eye and then exits. And this is a perforating injury uh, and may often be associated with an intraocular foreign body. Uh, here is an example of an eye rupture. You can see that there's been blunt trauma to the eye and the eye has uh, ruptured along a weak area. I often tell uh, students uh, or referring doctors when they're calling from the emergency room that if you see a chocolate colored dark dirty appearance to the wound, that's typically uh, the choroid or choroidal pigment or maybe even be the iris root and that helps them identify whether or not uh, there is an open globe. We can classify these injuries by grade or visual acuity um, and they may be uh, segregated into uh, four categories, greater than or equal to 2040, 2050 to 2100, 1900s to 5200s, or 4200 to light perception. So in other words, uh, quite good to quite poor. We may also segregate them by whether or not there is an afferent pupillary defect present. Uh, on the cartoon on your left, you see the light is being shown into the right eye and uh, the injured eye on the left uh, does not really respond. If the light is shown into the left eye and the right eye responds, that tells you that the neural connections from the injured eye are intact. So there's no afferent pupillary defect. But if you shine the light into the eye and in fact the fellow eye dilates or is non-responsive to the light, this is a positive afferent pupillary defect and implies a defect in the connection of the left eye. So it's a very gross test of functionality. Then lastly, we may classify uh, the type of injury by zone. Zone one is defined as the cornea and the limbus. So the area of the cornea out to the ocular limbus Secondly, uh, zone two is the limbus to five millimeters posterior to the sclera. And thirdly is posterior uh, from five millimeters uh, from the limbus to the posterior segment. And the reason for this zone definition is we're really trying to uh, consistently identify where uh, the interior of the eye is free of retina and where the retina begins. We know that the retina begins at the level of the insertion of the rectus muscles, so that's one way we can tell where there's retinal tissue. And this will become important when we have wounds involving this area because uh, it helps with our referral process and helps to know what to prepare for and whether or not to expect retinal injury. The ocular trauma score system is something that's used uh, primarily in research situations, but can also be used to help you estimate what the final visual acuity or predicted vision outcome is going to be in an injured eye. Uh, this is an example of the uh, OTS calculation. What we do is determine the initial visual acuity. So let's say in this case, uh, the vision at the time of presentation is light perception to hand motion. And then we add up uh, the other negative factors which are impacting this globe. So for example, if we have a globe rupture that's minus 23 points, with end off the Midas, that's minus 17 points. So 23 and 17 is 40. Uh, if we subtract 40 from 70, we end up with a score of 30 points, which we then flip the card over and look up our raw score. So a raw score of 30 would say that the chance of achieving greater than 2040 vision is about 1%. I will say when I've used this calculation, I tend to be quite a bit more optimistic. And I think that uh, that is borne out in the literature where a variety of groups have found that this score may underestimate the potential visual acuity. And that may be because as our technology improves, we're better and better at repairing these globes. <laughs> 
There are both uh, United States and World Eye Injury Registries, and these are forms that you can look up online and use uh, during your research or uh, prospective studies that you may wish to do. It's good to be using the same language across organizations. I wanted to touch on the epidemiology of uh, posterior segment trauma. In the United States, we know that the injury rate in the posterior segment group is about 29 per 100,000. Uh, the male to female ratio is three to one, and that's true across all countries, really. Of all those injuries, a total of 40,000 will be quite severe. So at least in the US, there are at least a million trauma patients who have a significant impairment. And that implies that there's quite a secondary economic uh, effect. When we look at who really is the injured party, uh, uh, most of these individuals will be male. A lot of them are construction workers. They're usually fairly young in the 25 to 35 age range. Uh, they may tend to be poorly educated. In the U.S., a lot of them are uh, associated with dangerous behaviors uh, such as drugs uh, or some situation where they don't have a good um, uh, understanding or characterization of the risk their eyes are in depending on uh, the actions that they're taking. A common place of injury is the workplace, and I know in many, many developing countries uh, there are huge construction projects going on uh, without an effort to uh, prevent this type of injury. Injuries in the domestic setting are rising, and auto accidents constitute between 11 and 17 percent, and that depends, of course, on your country and whether you're uh, using a lot of automobiles and what the rules are for driving. Uh, the source of trauma may be blunt, 31 to 45 percent of the time. Uh, and of course, that implies the rest of the time it's sharp or lacerating or associated with an intraocular foreign body. Uh, in addition to the victims being uh, primarily young, uh, we know that trauma is the number one cause of enucleation in people over three years old. So that's quite severe. Uh, in people under three years old, it's retinoblastoma. This is a preventable societal burden and prevention strategies at the governmental level are critical uh, to helping reduce uh, the burden of ocular trauma. And this would be all kinds of uh, eye preventive strategies uh, mandated by the government, such as safety glasses, et cetera. Uh, it's helpful uh, to remind ourselves of the surgical anatomy. I know you're all familiar with the anatomy of the eye but it's important to recall uh, the aura serrata, which is this orange demarcation here, is uh, adjacent to the insertion of the rectus muscles. Uh, when we look at the area of the eye which is most prone to rupture, uh, you can see that the area under the rectus muscles is 0 0.3 millimeters thick. Whereas the equator of the eye is 0.6 millimeters, uh, the limbus is 0.8 millimeters, and the posterior pole is one millimeter thick. When we evaluate a patient with an open globe, uh, the history is critical because they will often give a history of some type of force, such as a hammer or metal on metal, uh, and these are excellent clues to determine whether or not uh, there's a piece of uh, metal in the eye that must be removed. The level of vision is critical uh, and that's because not only does it predict the trauma uh, score outcome, uh, but it gives you a general idea of how badly the eye is injured. And finally, there should be a dilated eye exam in both eyes because even though one eye appears to be the injured eye, the fellow eye may also be injured or in fact be more severely injured. So you need to do your standard exam uh, without uh, deviation. Here's an example. Uh, this woman is in the operating room ready for surgical repair and you can see when you look at her, her left eye appears to be the one that's injured. It's all bruised and swollen. But when we examine her eyes, you can see that the right eye is the one that has the rupture at the limbus and you can see the dirty dirt-like choroidal tissue here whereas the left bruised eye uh, looks pretty nice. It's uh, got a formed cornea. Uh, indirect ophthalmoscopy shows the interior of the globe to be normal. 
Uh, finally, when you uh, have an open globe and you're preparing uh, to do surgery, which is the primary intervention uh, that you're contemplating, the patient needs to be NPO as soon as you see them. The eye should be shielded, and I know it's frequent that one's in an emergency room and there's no eye shield to be found. You can make an eye shield with a coffee cup, for example. You need to have something over the eye, first of all, to highlight to the nursing staff and other physicians that the eye is in a precarious state and to protect it until you can move into the operating room. A tetanus shot is given. Um, some of these people will feel quite nauseated, so an antiemetic should be ready. Um, as far as further investigation, x-rays of the eye, CT scans, B scans, uh, MRI scans, all of this can be done after the primary repair of the globe. So your first effort is to repair the globe and stabilize it, and you can then do these other tests to determine is there a foreign body, for example, what does the interior of the eye look like. Uh, here's the patient that we saw brought in by helicopter with a roofing nail through the eye. Uh, he was referred in with uh, some x-rays. And you can see on the x-rays we can appreciate the full length of the foreign body. He also was referred with a B-scan, and you can see the inside of the eye is fairly clear. So in this case, the, the uh, surgeon felt fairly confident in just removing this as the inner part, uh, intravitreal area uh, with the foreign body uh, was not involved. It may look like the globe is ruptured, but in fact, it's just displaced. And we see in this area, the, the uh, forester who was out looking up at a tree and removing the branches uh, was impaled with a stick uh, this loosened area, um, but the globe itself was not injured. Uh, as we start our evaluation and management, you move from the external eye internally. So in this case, the patient looks pretty normal. Uh, his uh, associate at work was using a nail gun and this gentleman bent over to tie his shoes. And when he did, the nail gun went off and the nail uh, went through his upper uh, brow area here. But when you pull the lid up, you can see a bead of vitreous here. So it impaled not only the lid, but the uh, superior uh, sclera. And in the fundus, you can see uh, there's an area of folded retina inferiorly uh, with an exit wound infronasally. And the uh, area of retinal detachment is identified because you can see this sort of folded grayish discoloration uh, of the retina. Uh, you'll note that we did our indirect ophthalmoscope exam early on when we had an opportunity because sometimes uh, vitreous hemorrhage um, and fibrin formation will obscure your view. So one of the first things you want to do is try to get a, a picture, an examination of the posterior segment uh, before the view is clouded, as in this case where the lens has become opaque. Uh, at the slit lamp, if there's some question about whether there's a corneal laceration, you can do a Seidel test, the same test you would do for uh, evaluating a glaucoma uh, filtering bleb. Uh, fluorescein uh, on a strip is dark orange when it's concentrated, and when it's applied uh, to the cornea, if there's an area of leakage, uh, the dye will dilute and become bright green. So that is known as a positive Seidel test. Uh, when you're looking at the anterior segment, uh, you can see that there may be suspicious areas, although you don't actually see a perforation. Sometimes the pupil will be, will be peaked toward an entry wound, or there may be a quadrantic area of lens rupture. In this case, the ocular media were clear, so one could see uh, this metallic foreign body embedded in the retina prior to the time that the blood begins to diffuse and obscure the view. Uh, finally, uh, many people will recommend checking the intraocular pressure, and I, uh, I think that that is really not helpful. Uh, if you 
are pressing on the eye and you're uh, either inexperienced or unaware uh, of what the range of pathology may be, knowing that the intraocular pressure is normal does not help you because you may have a posterior rupture with a normal or even an elevated pressure. If the pressure is low, that's, uh, that doesn't necessarily prove that there's a rupture. Uh, so I would just uh, prefer to defer that until a later time. Uh, the B scan is something that also may involve gentle pressure on the eye and does not really change your management with regard to primary repair. The general rule is if the B scan is fairly disorganized, then the interior of the eye is fairly disorganized and you cannot approach uh, fixing this problem until you have a stable, uh, secure primary globe repair. Uh, in this case, you can see the patient had a, uh, a uh, pry bar go through the anterior segment. Uh, the iris is missing, the lens is missing, and the pry bar uh, caused incarceration of the retina posteriorly. So our surgical goal is emergent eye wall closure. Um, I believe that you should repair an open eye as quickly as you can. And in a general hospital or an eye hospital, that may mean when can you get into the operating room? But you need to make the other doctors on the list or anesthesia aware uh, that this is an ophthalmic emergency. An eye wall should be closed prior to doing an elective appendix, for example. Uh, so in many cases, this will have to be done with general anesthesia or a laryngeal mask. Uh, we may repair the anterior segment with a microscope, but you really cannot see a posterior to the limbus well with the microscope. So as you move posteriorly on the eye, uh, you may need to switch to loops uh, to visualize what you're looking at, uh, or your own glasses correction may be sufficient as well. You should avoid pressure on the globe and perform a careful tissue dissection. Uh, Closure of the primary eye wall is the key to management here, and occasionally you'll have to manage the lens as well. Most of the time you just want to close the eye even if the eye seems ruptured, but if there is lens material coming out through the wound, you may need to clean that, that up as well before repairing the cornea. When we do the globe repair, it may be difficult in the middle of the night to remember what sutures you should use. Uh, I try to remember 8 9 10 uh, The cornea requires a fine suture, so 10 nylon with a spatulated needle is terrific. At the limbus, uh, 9 uh, nylon with a spatulated needle is fine. For the anterior sclera, 8 either nylon or uh, some people will use silk because it's a bit more inflammatory and helps the wound close faster. The, um, the posterior sclera may be so distorted and it's uh, fairly thick as you move very posterior. So you may even need to use a 7 uh, suture as you move posteriorly just to get enough force to close the eye. If we're doing corneal laceration repair, uh, minor uh, open globe injuries may be self-sealing. And in that situation, they can be treated with a contact lens. Uh, if the wound though is open, uh, what one wishes to do is uh, reposit any iris tissue. And this can be done by uh, injecting viscoelastic into the anterior chamber to help encourage the iris back into the eye or uh, to protect the posterior portion of the corneal wound from the suturing. So that's quite helpful in that it also helps control uh, minor bleeding. Uh, following that, you oppose the edges, and this can be done by finding the landmarks, uh, such as the limbus, uh, and then dividing the wound in half, uh, and then half again. Now, what I will say is that uh, the exception to this rule is if you're working, say, from the limbus toward the center of the cornea, uh, you may wish to start at the corneal edge and work in. The main thing is uh, to keep the two margins opposed to each other so that they uh, come out even or symmetrical, so to speak. Uh, this is an eye bank eye showing a laceration from the limbus, and you can see here uh, it has kind of an S shape 
So uh, there's a suture placed at the limbus to be sure that matches and then through the irregular middle of the wound, staying uh, perpendicular to the wound to oppose the main portions and following that uh, the remainder of the wound can be closed. Here's another example coming from the limbus into the center. You, you try to avoid the very central visual axis if you can. Uh, I should note that when you're placing these sutures, by the time you finish, there will often be a few of these sutures that are loose. So uh, I, would, I want you to know that that's a normal situation. Once you have stabilized the eye, you can go back and replace those loose sutures. Uh, finally, you want to uh, do your best to bury these knots because these will be quite irritating. So you want to rotate the sutures so that the knots are buried in the cornea or the corneoscleral limbus. When we talk about the uh, length and spacing of the sutures, you can see uh, in this diagram, the longer the suture, the broader the zone of compression. So if you have long sutures, you're more able to achieve a watertight wound. If you have multiple short sutures, you'll have a zone in between that doesn't really have a compression on it, so it will leak. Uh, so you want to make an effort to have a long suture that overlaps the zone of compression of the next suture. So here we have two long sutures. They overlap. They're both longer than this distance, and that can uh, help you uh, in trying to make the wound watertight. Um, when you speak to corneal surgeons, there can be some disagreement uh, in repair of the cornea, 90% uh, depth when you place your sutures versus full thickness depth. The goal is to try to reoppose the two portions of the cornea and not have a ridge left over. So I personally try for 90 to 95% depth because then I, I feel that I have not created another channel into the anterior chamber which might potentially uh, lead to endophthalmitis. Uh, here's an open wound unsutured laceration, which may be kind of a valve allowing a fluid into the eye, whereas uh, when it's sutured, that section of the cornea flattened. And there are corneal uh, surgeons who uh, try to do refractive care in that they put longer sutures at the limbus and shorter as they move toward the central cornea to give a better refractive outcome. Uh, here we see a corneal laceration and you can see uh, the matching corneal map with uh, flattening in the area uh, of the suture line. Here we have a shelved wound. You can see that the wound goes in and the key is to try to get this to oppose itself symmetrically. So you want to be able to imagine that you're closing the posterior area of the cornea well. You don't want to leave it open like this or when you see histopathology of injured eyes uh, subsequently when they're removed, this tissue override uh, leads to corneal failure and a pacification of the area that's been repaired. Corneal suturing, here's an, uh, an eye with a positive Seidel test, a bright green fluorescein dye. And here it is after suture placement, perpendicular to the wound and as long as possible. Now you may see eyes that have stellate wounds. A stellate wound uh, is a round hole in the front of the eye that may have many branches. Uh, you may want to close the branches and then try to make the center portion uh, watertight with a lasso or a complex uh, figure of eight suturing. As a last resort, we may put uh, glue over the area. Um, and you see here, sometimes you just have to kind of make up what kind of a suture uh, you're going to uh, evolve with. But the middle part here is the area that we're still having some leakage. So you remove the epithelium without cutting the sutures uh, and then dry the area carefully and put a tiny droplet of dental glue 
on the surface uh, that usually will spread out and stick for a couple of days and you can aid that by uh, applying a contact lens. I think one of the questions submitted was what to do with iris prolapse. Uh, and you can see here that's prolapsing iris. Uh, this looks quite healthy. So I would uh, take, take uh, visco and gently encourage this back into the anterior chamber and then repair the cornea. Now, if this tissue has been exposed for uh, several days, it may be necrotic. If it obviously cannot be uh, salvaged, you should cut it off. But that is something that will require a secondary repair of the iris um, to make a reasonable pupil, for example. So I would go uh, out of my way to try to uh, hydrate this first with balanced salt solution and then reposit it with a visco. Uh, you can approach uh, tissue that's incarcerated in the wound by swiping it. Uh, with a, uh, a, um, an instrument and then placing visco to protect the posterior cornea. Uh, as we move posteriorly on the eye, uh, conjunctival pyridomy is performed to visualize the limbus and that, that so-called zone two area. Uh, you perform your conjunctival pyridomy for visualization and then you approximate the limbal uh, areas. So uh, this I think is pretty obvious. This corner goes here, this corner goes here, and this corner goes here. So you suture that uh, so that you uh, feel confident that you're putting the eye back together correctly. Uh, the, this particular uh, picture shows uh, an eye that has been prepared for surgery by slinging the muscles as we would to do a scleral buckle, for example. Um, and that is something that you can do gently if you need to explore uh, further back toward the equator, for example. Here is the appearance of the rectus muscle being pulled out of the way. You would want to do this quite gently because the thin area of the sclera behind uh, the iris here is the area of potential uh, likely rupture. And if that were to be the case and I saw a rupture here, I would suture one side and then move the muscle to the other side without disinserting it and suture the other side. Uh, you can then move back to the equator. Uh, I think people who do scleral buckle surgery or strabismus surgery would be uh, comfortable with this. This is where you have to uh, uh, forsake your microscope and use loops or your own uh, refractive correction because the microscope just doesn't tilt well enough uh, to see this area easily. Uh, then we want to do a watertight closure. Uh, here uh, the cornea and uh, limbus has been opposed but these sutures are still pretty short. So once we have things in place we would place longer sutures and then remove these. Here's an example of a watertight closure. You see how close these sutures had to be to make this wound watertight. These happen to be uh, 80 silk so that you can see them easily in the subconjunctival space. Lastly, you want to measure the wound and put a sketch in the chart because the physician following you, for example, the referral physician will want to know is this four millimeters or is it nine millimeters? In this case, this goes back nine millimeters, so we know there's very likely a retinal break or potential retinal involvement in this area. Um, now, one of the things that has been recommended is uh, muscle disinsertion. I think that is only very rarely necessary. Uh, the muscle can be recognized because it has that celery-like striated appearance. And if you did have to take a muscle off, for example, uh, because there's a huge laceration that you just can't approach otherwise, uh, you would put the muscle on 6-0 uh, suture, just as you would for adjustable muscle surgery, remove the muscle, and then replace it by suturing through the muscle insertion uh, to place the muscle back on the eye in the same position. If you're at the equator, you may not be able to reach further back. So what you do is start suturing in the anterior portion of the wound toward the posterior pole, much like closing a zipper, although you may not be able to close the posterior portion of the wound. 
Uh, here uh, we demonstrate this approach to a perpendicular suture placement. Uh, you can tie a surgeon's knot, three throws, one throw, one throw, uh, to secure the wound. And you can see as we move posteriorly, this entire wound was able to be closed because it's an eye bank eye. But sometimes that's not the case. You may get it as far back as you can. And then the last little bit you simply cannot reach without being at risk of extrusion of tissue. So you leave that alone and that will self seal and granulate in uh, typically within 48 to 72 hours. So you don't stitch it if it's uh, a posterior perforation. Here's the optic nerve and here's the uh, nail coming through the back of the eye. So you remove the nail, but you leave this alone. Uh, special considerations we have to keep in mind. It's very uh, unlikely that you'll have to do a primary enucleation. If there's just nothing to fix, you might, but it's better to sew up what you can, even if uh, you can tell that you don't have a chance of repairing the eye, because psychologically it takes the patients a few days to adjust to the fact that they're gonna lose the eye. And after you've had a discussion with them, then it's better to go back and enucleate the eye if you feel that that is indicated. Uh, this is another example. This is a 30-year-old male who uh, had a, a um, mental disability. He'd had congenital cataracts as a child and then secondary implants with a neurodegenerative disease. And he came in with 20-50 acuity in one eye and no light perception in this eye. Uh, you can see that technically this is an open globe. Here is his secondary implant and you see the foot plate of his intraocular lens. Uh, bridging over the limbus here, so the globe is open, uh, but there's no view of the posterior pole because of the blood, uh, etc. So in this case, we're always taught in residency to do a B scan because you just never know what you may find, even though we typically uh, don't find anything. However, when we did this B scan, you can see there's a V-shaped retinal detachment, but there's also a mushroom-shaped uh, unknown lesion here. So if we're going to call this mushroom shape, that in your mind should uh, take you to a potential diagnosis. Uh, when we see a mushroom shape on B-scan, we think of a malignant melanoma. And surely uh, he did have a posterior segment choroidal malignant melanoma. Uh, and here's the anterior chamber intraocular lens. So as you can see, this eye was then uh, nucleated. Uh, Post-traumatic endophthalmitis is one of the most feared complications of globe trauma. It may occur in anywhere from 2 to 7% of normal ruptured globes, but if the rupture is complicated by a ruptured lens, intraocular foreign bodies, a dirty wound, it may be as high or higher than 30% risk. Uh, how do we determine if there is endophthalmitis? Uh, my rule is if I even think about endophthalmitis, I will treat for it very aggressively. If you see intraocular inflammation with a hypopion, if there's retinal perifilobitis beginning, if you can see your intraocular foreign body and it's beginning to develop exudate around uh, the margins of the intraocular foreign body, you should treat. I'd recommend prophylactic intravitreal antibiotics, and this depends on your, uh, your skill level. Um, you certainly should do the primary repair of the eye first, and once the globe pressure has been normalized, prophylactic intravitreal antibiotics may be given. And these are given in cases with periphlebitis, purulent foreign bodies, soil-related injuries in a rural setting, or delayed primary closure. If the eye has been open for three or four days or longer, uh, the risk of endophthalmitis uh, is quite high. Now, uh, this is an old series of uh, the typical uh, organisms found uh, during a culture uh, in an endophthalmitis uh, post-traumatic open globe setting. The common ones are Staphylococcus, uh, Strep viridens, uh, Gram positive rods, Bacillus serious, and you can remember that. You can think Bacillus serious is serious. This is the most serious organism uh, because it's virulent. Uh, it has to, uh, it's very damaging to the retinal photoreceptors, 
and hard to salvage these eyes. You can see in this group of patients, uh, 14 of 18 eyes had to be enucleated because of the uh, extent of the endophthalmitis. And I mentioned earlier, rural endophthalmitis is a much higher rate, 30%, than garden variety uh, endophthalmitis. So uh, after we form the globe, uh, we try to do uh, taps of the anterior and posterior chamber. If you have to choose, the, the vitreous tap is the more important because it has a higher yield. Uh, you measure four millimeters back uh, from the limbus going through the pars plana. Uh, one mistake I see is people uh, will often use a very small needle, like a 25 or a 30 gauge needle. Um, you really will need a larger needle, such as a 20 gauge, uh, to get a good sample of material. Otherwise, you'll have a dry tap a significant percentage of the time. And this can be plated on glass slides for gram stain, bacterial uh, stain, gimsa or caldophora for fungus staining, and then cultures on uh, the plates you have available uh, for, bio, for both gram positive, gram negative uh, fungus uh, uh, and anaerobic materials. Now, uh, you may not have all of these materials available. So if you don't, one other option is to place your sample in a blood culture bottle, which most laboratories, uh, even in rapidly developing countries, will have available. The prophylactic intravitreal antibiotics are vancomycin 1 milligram in 0.1 cc's, uh, and this treats the gram-positive organisms, including the Bacillus cereus I spoke about, and uh, Staph epidermidis. Uh, ceph uh, uh, cefazolin uh, is one of the uh, class of drugs, and you may have others similar to this that would be uh, effective in your hospital. This is 2.25 milligrams and 0.1 cc's, and this is treating the gram-negative organisms. Um, you can find the recipe for how to prepare these drops uh, in the Wills Hospital eye manuals or on the internet. Um, if you're fortunate, your pharmacy can do it for you. If not, you have to do it, but you have to be very careful to have this correct because you can uh, permanently damage the retina if you're overdosing uh, with your uh, antibiotics. Now, amicacin, <coughs> pardon me, we don't use very much anymore because of the risk of retinal infarction. But if that's the only drug you have, uh, then it's helpful. Uh, I would stay away from it as best you can unless there's not another alternative. Uh, Ceftazidime is another alternative, two milligrams and 0.1 mils. We also, uh, although there has not been a, a big clinical trial that uh, approves this one way or the other, we generally give systemic antibiotics. Uh, the patient is usually in the hospital, at least in the US, for about three days. Uh, so uh, we have the opportunity to give IV uh, vancomycin and IV ceftazidine. Uh, the patient's then discharged home, and at that point, we switch to oral ciprofloxacin. One could begin with oral ciprofloxacin, but as the antibiotic sensitivity of organisms change, you'd have to determine from your uh, local infectious disease uh, physicians uh, if that's still appropriate in your setting. Uh, in some cases, uh, we add Decadron 0.4 milligrams if there's been a lens rupture, for example, or, or there's a reason that the patient has a big fibrinoid response, such as a late presentation, late repair, we'll add intravitreal Decadron as well. Uh, if you have a corneal wound, I usually use uh, the same topical antibiotics I might use for a corneal ulcer. Uh, and I think that increases the... Um, the uh, kill rate for um, bacteria introduced into the anterior chamber. And those might include fortified genomycin, 15 milligrams per mil, and fortified uh, cefazolin, 50 milligrams per mil. But this is a personal preference. And topical steroids are helpful as well to uh, reduce the fibrin formation after uh, lens rupture. Subconjunctival uh, drugs, genomycin 20 milligrams per mil and cefazolin 50 to 100 milligrams per mil are helpful with alternatives being clindamycin 34 milligrams per mil or vancomycin 25 milligrams per mil. Uh, 
Uh, fungal infection is uh, rare in the United States, but more common in uh, some of the Indian literature. Um, uh, up to 10 to 15% of patients will have a fungal infection, which is quite serious. And this can be treated with voriconazole, 400 milligrams orally. I wouldn't do this unless you had a positive culture or a stain proving that there's fungus present and intravitreal amphotericin B, five to 10 micrograms. Special considerations of uh, retinal surgery. Uh, in a traumatized eye, uh, some feel that it's helpful to place a thin prophylactic scleral buckle, uh, even in the face of vitrectomy, because it's often very hard to treat the anterior vitreous. And if you're forced to leave the anterior vitreous, the vitreous base, that can contract and cause more breaks to form in the post-operative period. So just a 220 band here prior to vitrectomy in concert with vitrectomy may be helpful. Uh, the timing of vitreous intervention is important. Uh, we often try to delay the vitreous surgery uh, for five days or more to allow the posterior hyoid to spontaneously separate from the retina because it can be very difficult to peel vitreous, particularly admixed blood, with blood from the surface of the retina. One exception to this is in pediatric cases. Uh, one may need to do uh, a core vitrectomy early because the vitreous is so adherent to the retina. Uh, the main thing is to uh, remove uh, most of the vitreous scaffolding and get the antibiotics injected in that situation. Uh, there are intraocular foreign bodies that should be considered. Uh, the first is uh, iron, uh, which is quite inflammatory. We call that siderosis. Uh, the iron uh, affects primarily the neuroepithelium of the eye, which is specifically targets uh, the retinal photoreceptors and the retinal pigment epithelium. Uh, you may see uh, reduced ERG over time if there is an occult foreign body and uh, the appearance of staining or yellowing of the lens surface. The iris may have heterochromia, uh, brown deposits on the retina uh, with uh, retinal uh, uh, narrowed retinal vessels, optic disc uh, discoloration. So this is quite an important uh, area of therapy that you should undertake. There are many, many ways to take out these iron uh, or uh, uh, other associated foreign bodies. In this particular case, uh, the metal could be uh, picked up with a foreign body for us, but sometimes it's more embedded and it needs to be loosened or unroofed from its inflammatory uh, covering uh, and then picked up with a uh, magnet. These magnets are rare earth magnets and they're active for about three millimeters on either side of the tip of the magnet. Um, there are some situations where the metallic foreign body is uh, very anterior in the eye, anterior to the retina. And if they can be approached by cutting down uh, or forming a little uh, rent over the foreign body, they can be removed with a stronger magnet held against the tip of the sclera. Each eye, each uh, case has to be individualized, I would say. The other metal we need to pay attention to is copper, which is very inflammatory. Uh, copper in the eye is called chalcosis and can cause quite an inflammatory reaction. Uh, in this situation, you can see that uh, the copper has become uh, deposited in the cornea. Uh, and we call this um, a decimase membrane Kaiser Fleischhauer ring here. They might form a cataract that looks like a sunflower, sunflower cataract. Uh, and this has to be removed expediently because of the inflammatory uh, nature of the metal. Uh, other metals, zinc and aluminum, are not so inflammatory. They may become encapsulated and, and uh, may be observed. There are non-metallic foreign bodies such as vegetable matter or glass. Uh, these can be left in the eye and observed. So we'll repeat our poll here. Uh, the sclera is thinnest at A, the limbus, B, the equator, C, the rectus insertions, or D, the macula. Excellent, and that is the correct answer. Rectus insertions, 88%. You recall the 0.3 millimeter thickness of the sclera under the rectus muscles.
Siderosis refers to what type of intraocular foreign body? Excellent, iron, and that is correct. Uh, what is the most severe form of traumatic endophthalmitis? Yes, that's correct. Bacillus cereus is serious and most commonly found in rural dirty settings. So uh, quite correct. I'm just going to briefly go through a few of these cases uh, to give you uh, some visual examples. We've already reviewed this case and here uh, you recall we were able to pull the nail out. So this portion was seen uh, anteriorly in the eye and this was in the vitreous cavity. So a vitreous tap was performed to culture the eye and intravitreal in, uh, antibiotics injected. This is a rarely complex figure of eight corneal closure and that patient did achieve 20-40 visual acuity. This is the gentleman who had the air powered nail gun we discussed earlier with the entry wound the vitreous bead, the posterior um, perforation. You can see the stria related to the retinal detachment quite well. Watertight closure. And you can appreciate the subretinal fluid here where the detail of the choroid is not well seen. Here the retina is attached, here the retina is detached. Uh, this is the first vitrectomy. Uh, you can see a gas bubble was used to tamponade this area, but there's still residual subretinal fluid here on the surface of this scleral buckle. You can see the shoulder of the scleral buckle. And still in the post-operative period, a little residual fluid. So after observation for a while, this was not disappearing. If it doesn't disappear, it means there's a micro break somewhere that hasn't been treated and repeat vitrectomy with a laser surrounding the posterior wound with the sharp margin of the scleral buckle and laser scars on the surface of the buckle, uh, which solved the problem of any residual occult leakage and the retina remained reattached with visual acuity of 2050 one year later. Uh, this is a 63 year old farmer who had multiple prior chainsaw incidents. You can see these scars on his face from being injured with his chainsaw. Here's one on his lip. And he was up on his roof removing a metal uh, from the surface of the barn. Uh, lacerated his cornea with the metal. You can see here the knots are buried and they are perpendicular to the wound. Even though the eye has a primary closure, there's still quite a bit of fibrin here. So the suspicion is, is this inflammatory or is it endophthalmitis? Uh, he also had a partial uh, lens rupture. So the lens was removed. Eventually he had a secondary implant, uh, but he also achieved excellent 20-30 uh, visual acuity. Uh, here's a gentleman who uh, states that he pulled wire out of his eye. Here's a, here's a wire brush. Micro perforation, very tiny. Uh, this was self-sealing. So uh, he was sent to photography for photos because of his vitreous hemorrhage. And the photographer came back and said, I think I see something in the retina. He was probably waiting several hours in our retina clinic to get his photos done. And in that time, the blood cleared. And you can see a typical posterior exit wound from the eye or at least a posterior penetration. So in that case, it's really a perforation because he had two openings in the eye. So he was treated with intravitreal antibiotics and monitored with B-scan, no surgery yet. Vitreous hemorrhage cleared over time. Uh, didn't completely clear by three months. He then had vitrectomy with laser and achieved 20-20 visual acuity. Uh, this one we already talked about. There's the posterior wound. Uh, here's an example of a gentleman with needle nose pliers entering the eye and the posterior fibrotic exit wound. 
again, excellent visual acuity. I'm just going to show you two more cases. Here's a gentleman who uh, was hammering and pulling metal out of a floor with his hammer. You can see uh, he was hit in the nose here and then the, this part of the eye became red. He came in after about three days feeling somewhat uh, uh, anxious and a little eye pain uh, on left gaze at the slit lamp. You could see the foreign body behind his lens, adherent to the posterior uh, capsule of the lens. He then started to develop anterior segment cell uh, and had intravitreal antibiotics and removal with an external magnet. Another gentleman with metal in the angle. I just wanted to show you this picture. This is a lady that fell in her rocking chair and you see this hyperemia. Any eye like this should be explored, whether it's ruptured or not, because you simply cannot tell on clinical examination whether there's a rupture. And then the last patient I want to share with you is this gentleman who was 79 when he came in on a Sunday morning with acute pain in the eye. His past history was at age 10, he was in the uh, beer bottle distribution plant in Ireland when uh, the bottles blew up and struck him in the face. Uh, he spent two months in the hospital and must have had a lacerated globe which spontaneously healed. When he came to us, he had a small hypopion and you can see here, post-operative, these areas were Cydel positive. So he had constant leakage of micro perforations from the wound and was treated not only with intravitreal antibiotics and vitrectomy, but a patch graft to close the wound. So in summary, uh, the emergent exploration of a suspected open globe is critical. Eye wall should be closed using suture, uh, recalling the 809010 rule. And you should always uh, think on your list, end off the Midas, end off the Midas, end off the Midas, and treat aggressively. Thank you. Uh, this first question involves uh, sympathetic ophthalmia. Are you not concerned about sympathetic ophthalmia with not considering a primary evisceration in cases of extensive open globe rupture with NLP? Uh, the answer is uh, we rarely uh, treat unless we treat with systemic steroids or systemic anti-inflammatories. So removing the eye for uh, the potential sympathetic ophthalmia uh, is not the first choice of therapy at this time. Uh, if it's obvious that there are not enough pieces and parts uh, to work with, then of course you could enucleate or eviscerate. I know in some countries I've worked in, evisceration is quite common. Uh, the last time I made rounds in East Africa, I think there were probably 10 or 12 people in the hospital uh, who had had their eyes eviscerated. And I have never, uh, in my practice, been exposed to that in the U.S. So I think it's just a different form of approach to therapy. Um, should we apply cryo around the posterior scleral wound after suturing? And the answer to that is no, because the posterior scleral wound is already going to be very inflamed. So it's not required to apply cryo around the posterior scleral wound. Um, and next, what to do with recurrent bleeding perioperatively in a case of traumatic hyphema after contusion with eye hypertension? Uh, if you have a so-called eight ball hyphema with high pressure, you need to drain the anterior chamber and very likely do a vitrectomy. Uh, a, a traumatic hyphema with a high pressure uh, is something that requires surgical drainage. Lastly, sometimes general anesthesia or laryngeal mask is not available. How safe is the use of uh, subtenons and facial block in repairing open globes? Uh, the facial block might be okay, but I think the subtenons is quite risky. Uh, the two problems, if you don't know where the rupture is, uh, you could enter the globe in a soft eye. And the second thing is the anesthesia going to enter the vitreous cavity, which could be toxic to the retina. Uh, if the globe is soft, what would you use to fill the globe? I would use balanced salt solution to pump it up, so to speak. Uh, 
the I would not use viscode. I think one of the other questioners early on was filling the eye with viscode, and the problem there is the pressure may well be uncontrollable. Uh, so you could use, in addition, air or expanding C3F8, uh, but I uh, I wouldn't use viscode uh, because of the attendant issues, and I also uh, would not use silicone oil because you're not in control of the situation yet. Uh, is it advisable to repair iris or lens washout at the time of initial globe repair? That is an, a, that's a judgment call you'll have to make. I would say most of the time, no, you close the eye and then understand what your repair has to be because you may be able to put a secondary lens in, for example. It may take a day to find the correct lens. Uh, repairing the iris is very hard to do in a soft eye. Uh, or a uh, just repaired eye, the risk of bleeding is quite high. If you touch the iris even, it will bleed. So the point of waiting a day or two or three is to get control of the bleeding situation and enhance your visualization. The only thing I might add is when I went through the questions, someone asked about any special pediatric considerations. Uh, one of those is that the organism involved in pediatric endophthalmitis with ruptured globe in many cases is an E. coli uh, fecalis, which is something very hard to treat with antibiotics. Vancomycin has been used, but uh, there's a high uh, resistance rate. Uh, so uh, the type of antibiotics used in your environment is important to know. Also, uh, management of uh, the lens and management of potential amblyopia are critical. 